All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's do a review of some basic chemistry for the APES test. So first we'll talk about photosynthesis. And this is what is done by all, all producers, including plants and um, algae. And the chemical reaction for that is that they take CO2 from the air and they combine it with water to form sugar, which is C6H12O6. And this sugar can then go on to um, form more complex sugars, things like cellulose, which is a type of starch material. And that's what leaves are made out of, or woody matter. Okay, so let's um, talk about respiration then. Respiration, of course, is what we do as consumers. And it's the opposite process. So in that, we take the sugar, C6H12O6, and we, our body ends up converting it into CO2, which we exhale, and H2O. When we eat other foods like proteins or fats, we can get energy from those too. Our body ultimately converts those molecules into sugar molecules, which is what our cells use. Okay, so when we go take a look at this equation in the top for photosynthesis, Respiration is just the opposite of that. There's respiration. Uh, what happens if you have um, sugars that are not being consumed but decomposed by anaerobic? So we should recognize that what we do is called anaerobic, I'm sorry, what we do is called aerobic respiration. And um, let's use black for that. So in aerobic respiration, we give off CO2, and that's in the presence of O2. When you have anaerobic decomposition, you get methane produced, CH4. Okay, and that of course is in the absence of oxygen, so O2 when that is not present. So let's move on to a, re a review of the nitrogen cycle. See if you can match these up correctly before we go over it. So you should pause. Okay, welcome back. So if you said nitrification uh, is the process, well, let's start from the, the beginning. Nitrogen fixation is where nitrogen gas from the atmosphere is turned into what we call ammonia or ammonia ions. And then <clears throat> those ammonia ions are converted into nitrates, and that's called nitrification. And to complete the cycle, nitrates are converted back to N2 into the atmosphere, and that's called denitrification. So let's see that in the next slide. All right, so in this video, in this slide, we're going to take a look at the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen gas is all around us in the form that we call N2, 78% of the atmosphere. And in order to make it available for organisms, it has to be converted into other forms, specifically um, nitrates. So the first step in this is called nitrogen fixation. And that's, as we can see, when the N2 goes to ammonia, NH4. And this happens by two ways. One way is by lightning. And the lightning has enough energy to split apart the N2 molecule and make it react with um, components in the air. But um, it also happens by specialized bacteria called rhizobium, or rhizobia for plural, bacteria. And these bacteria live on the roots of legume plants, on roots of legume plants. And a legume would be like beans, dry beans, pinto beans, etc. Uh, let me see if I can write that a little more clearly. Legume plants. Okay, so one way you can help to fertilize your soil is have a growing season of legume plants in between your other plants. Or in between your other seasons. Okay, so common misconception, people sometimes think that it's legume plants that are doing the nitrogen fixation, but no, it's the bacteria living on their roots. Okay, but that's not enough. We have to go one step further. 
So the next step is for that ammonia to then be converted into nitrates. And this step is called nitrification. And it is also done by specialized bacteria. I'm not going to just say bacteria, I'm going to say specialized bacteria because not all bacteria do these kinds of functions. And generally it's different bacteria that do nitrification compared to the ones that do nitrogen fixation. Once it's in the form of nitrates, then we can have what happens called uh, uptake, where the plants take it up into the roots. And then what we call assimilation, which means they actually use what they uptake and make it become part of them. And when animals eat the plants, now those nutrients go into the animals. Eventually, both the plants and the animals die and decompose. And in that process of decomposing, we have these nitrates going back into ammonia. And this step is called ammonification. Ammonification. Ultimately, in order to make this cycle complete, we have to have some way of reforming the nitrogen gas. Otherwise, over time, it would deplete. And so there are still other bacteria that do the step called denitrification. And so we will say again by specialized bacteria. Okay, and thus completes the process. Now, this is how nature does it, but we, all, we have learned how to synthesize ammonia from nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. We learned how to do that in the early 1900s, and that has allowed us to make synthetic fertilizers. If you go to a store and buy miracle Grow, it contains synthetic nitrates, and you put them in your soil, and your plants are very happy because they need those nitrates. They uptake it. But in doing so, we are taking too much N2 out of the atmosphere and putting it into too much nitrates, which have the effects of creating algae blooms. And, um, and with, the al with the algae blooms, you eventually get too much algae growth. And then when that dies, the decomposers eat it up too quickly. And in doing so, they use up the oxygen. So we have that process that we call eutrophication, making the waters have too many nitrates, too many nutrients too good for plant growth, and that ultimately leads in hypoxia, um, a drop in dissolved oxygen, creating dead zones. Okay, so that's what I want to go over with the nitrogen cycle. Here's our textbook's version of the drawing of the nitrogen cycle. I guess one thing that I'll just point out here is that um, this process is also happening here uh, in the ocean by different bacteria, but ultimately the same processes, processes are happening. All right, so try your, try your luck at this question. Which of the following nutrients does not exist in a gas state in the, atm <clears throat> in the atmosphere? Okay, so go ahead and pause it. All right, so if you said phosphorus, that is the correct answer choice. Let's take a quick look at the phosphorus cycle for review. So here we see the phosphorus cycle, and uh, the main thing I want to point out is that a lot of phosphorus comes from sediment and sedimentary rock so down here and it can dissolve into the water and then eventually it gets carried up to the surface during upwelling and um, one thing that can also happen then is uh, um, birds can eat the fish and the algae that are at the surface here or fish eat the, um, birds eat the fish which eat the algae which took in the phosphorus and those birds as they're flying above the land can now poop and drop that phosphorus um, which can make some very phosphorus rich areas on the land in coastal areas and the other thing I want to point out here is that you can also get phosphorus coming from this sedimentary rock through geologic uplift so as um, deep rock is brought to the surface then it makes available rock that we can mine for phosphorus but ultimately phosphorus is a non-renewable Oh, and limited supply nutrient that we use for fertilizers. So we should make sure we're really making good use of our organic growing methods where we use manure and things like that to 
to um, provide the phosphorus. So I'll leave this slide here. You can take a look at it if you'd like. Um, it's very similar to the last one. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, we'll just mention that phosphorus can also lead to eutrophication because plants need both nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, our next nutrient cycle, carbon. See if you can determine the correct order from largest carbon reservoirs to smallest. Go ahead and pause it. Okay, welcome back. Let's see how you did. So number one is ocean sedimentary rock. And number two is ocean water. And then we have fossil fuels. And then four, atmosphere. And finally, plants, biomass. So let's take a look at that in this diagram here. So here's our sedimentary rock, bottom left. Down here. And um, next would be, and we can see 80 million units there. Oceans, 38,000 units. Fossil fuels, 4,000 units. Atmosphere, 815. And lastly would be... Um, land plants 560 okay so let's take a look at the next slide so let's take a look at uh, this process here co2 in the atmosphere can dissolve into the ocean where it mixes with um, uh, water and calcium to make calcium carbonate shells for seashell and, um, and ultimately, when those seashell organisms die, then the shells go to the bottom, they get broken up into a sand kind of uh, material, and then eventually they become sedimentary rock. So that's why this is such a big number, because there are so many seashell creatures in the ocean. And, um, and so much CO2 dissolved in the ocean, that's where this number comes from. And of course, um, fossil fuels we know are hydrocarbons stored, um, you know, remains from anaerobic decomposition of swampy areas and um, any place that was anaerobic. So let's point out a couple of key processes here. When we extract and burn the fossil fuels, we are putting that CO2 from the fossil fuels back into the atmosphere. And um, so that makes the CO2 level more elevated, and that's what we talk about, you know, burning fossil fuels contributing to increasing greenhouse gases. But um, the CO2 also does get taken up by plants through the process of photosynthesis. But when we do excessive deforestation, then we don't have as much photosynthesis occurring on the planet. And so that, um, that also has the effect of making the CO2 increase. Okay, let's take a look at the next. So that was a nice lead into combustion. And with combustion, we take hydrocarbons we combine them with oxygen, and what we get out of it is CO2 and water vapor. And by hydrocarbon, <clears throat> the most simple hydrocarbon would be methane, which is just CH, H, 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 CH4. But you can get long carbon chains, and this is what we see in gasoline. And on every one of these carbons, you have hydrogens attached. So this would be called a long chain hydrocarbon and coal has even longer chains. Okay, so um, I'm gonna erase this just so that we can kind of get it out of our way. But um, what I wanna talk about is some of the pollutants that come from this combustion process. So first thing that we can have is sometimes we get carbon monoxide and that can happen when there's not enough oxygen during the reaction and it's, it's toxic, so it's considered a pollutant. And when you're, boiling, when you're burning coal, you also get socks from sulfur in the, in the coal. And this would be coal. And anytime you have high heat, like what happens during a combustion, you get the formation of nitrogen oxides. Nitrogen gas in the air can mix with the oxygen and form those oxides. All right. So these two that we just listed, these are considered primary pollutants because they go on to form secondary pollutants, H2SO4 and H 
NO3, which are secondary pollutants that are responsible for acid deposition, acid rain. And those would be the, um, yeah, so we can fix this problem of acid rain by using smokestack scrubbers when we're burning coal. So let's do that in green as a solution. So smokes, um, smokestack scrubbers. The scrubbing part of it is what's really removing the oxygen, I mean the sulfur oxides. And it's doing that chemically. You're taking SOx, you're mixing it with some kind of a, you know, I forget the details, but it's a calcium mineral. I think it's calcium oxide. And out of it you're getting calcium sulfates. And this is like a slurry. So it's something that you can actually collect, whereas these are just gases. And since you can collect it, then you can, you know, bury it or do whatever you want with it. Or use it as the precursor to some other chemical process to make some other different product. And um, recording here, so just ignore me. Okay, so let's also talk about photochemical smog, which comes from cars. And you have VOCs, which would be like unburned fuel hydrocarbons. And <clears throat> you also have the nitrogen oxides. Those are the two main components, uh, the two main primary pollutants. And then you combine that with UV from sunlight. And through some complex chemical equations, chemical reactions, you get ozone produced. And of course, you also have this haziness that we associate with smog. This O3 is, of course, a tissue irritant. It can make your eyes burn, your lungs burn. Plants, leaves can turn yellow. So this is, keep in mind, tropospheric ozone, which down here is bad, but up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, it is good. So how can we solve this problem? Well, we just saw that with coal burning, we can solve the acid rain problem using smokestack scrubbers. Now we're able to solve the photochemical smog problem using something called catalytic converters. And what these do is they make sure that the hydrocarbons get fully burned off inside of the, this is like part of the tailpipe. So the hydrocarbons get burned properly into CO2 plus H2O. And these converters also make sure that any carbon, actually let's step back from it. They also make sure that any NOx NOx gets converted into nitrogen and oxygen. And so that immediately just wiped out these two as a source of the problem of ground level ozone. One other thing they do, which is kind of a bonus, which is nice, is they take the carbon monoxide and they convert it to carbon dioxide and H2O. So they fully burn off the carbon monoxide. Okay? So let's talk here for a moment about greenhouse gases. We've already been mentioning how CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and as well as methane. CO2 has the biggest global warming effect on the planet. CH4 methane, also big. And nitrous oxide. Notice that this is not NO2 which is what we were just talking about a moment ago. And, um, and also molecules like this one called HCF23, which is a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. And um, it's also, it's very potent. But CO2 and methane, these are the top two as far as having an effect on the planet. Um, even though HFC is the strongest one per molecule. Okay, now what I want to talk about with this is that CO2 can cause ocean acidification. So I want to do just a quick review of that. As elevated CO2 levels in the atmosphere occur, CO2 can dissolve into the ocean and form carbonic acid. CO2 plus H2O forms this stuff we call H2CO3. All I'm doing is just rearranging the atoms there. Carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid um, 
lowers the pH of the ocean. Not, um, not a, a lot, it's not like lemon juice by any means, but it's enough that coral can die off. Um, it's enough that it can interfere with perhaps um, fish breeding, maybe their eggs don't fertilize properly because the pH is too low. And um, yes, so um, that's all I want to mention right now about greenhouse gases. But maybe we should mention one more thing. Methane comes from anaerobic, just to reinforce there, anaerobic decomposition. And cows, in their stomachs, they have anaerobic bacteria, and then they fart. All right, so let's do a little review of ozone depletion. We're talking stratospheric ozone here. It starts with CFC molecules. So that would be like a carbon in the middle, a fluorine. Oops, carbon. Uh, I should have drawn there a fluorine. F. Maybe this is a chlorine. This is another F, and this is a chlorine. And this chlorine can break off. So now you have a chlorine molecule that can combine with an ozone and form chlorine oxide plus O2. That's it. We just destroyed that ozone molecule. And then this ClO molecule can combine with a free oxygen in the air to form Cl plus O2. And it is this Cl that can then go back and um, destroy more um, more ozone molecules. So this process can repeat over and over. So the only way to stop this process is to stop the production of the CFCs. And we did that with the Montreal Protocol. Before we leave this part, let's just mention that this process can repeat thousands of times where that chlorine just goes around and around destroying ozone molecules before eventually um, being degraded by forces of nature. Okay, well, let me know if you have any questions that you want to go over still. Uh, you can catch me Monday morning before the test, 7 o'clock in my classroom. All right, see you later.